My name is Michael Bell. Um, I am an astrophysicist. I work at uh, a small company up in Beverly, Mass, called Frontier Technology. We primarily work on, um, well, we provide a bunch of services for imaging satellite missions, a lot of uh, infrared and visible imaging satellites. Um, I, won't, I haven't been doing that too long. Before uh, I was at Frontier, I had a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics uh, just north of Munich. And um, while I was there, uh, the group that I was working in, we had a number of different astrophysical applications we were working on, but um, we were all very interested in developing new statistical inference techniques in our various subdisciplines of astrophysics. Um, so while, uh, while I was there, um, my group developed this new software tool called Nifty. It's a Python library that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I was just one of several uh, designers and developers of Nifty, um, so I'm giving this talk on behalf of everybody uh, who worked on, on this project, and in particular, uh, the first guy in the list here, Marco Selig, he, uh, he's the main um, developer and the current uh, active maintainer of the software. So if you, if you start using Nifty and you have questions or whatever, um, I mean, any one of us might respond, but it's probably going to be Marco. Um, so what is Nifty? Nifty um, is a, it's a framework for developing statistical inference algorithms. Um, it doesn't have, you know, a lot of uh, pre-canned algorithms within it. It provides you with um, tools and an object-oriented architecture to make developing your own uh, inference algorithms a lot easier. Um, I have put up uh, the slides for this talk. Um, here at this URL. So you can check that out if you want to follow along. And I've also got a, an IPython notebook that um, I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to go over a little bit later so you can uh, grab that um, to make it a little bit easier to follow along. Um, also, I'll note that we have a paper uh, describing, the, describing Nifty, its features, and sort of the design philosophy behind Nifty on, the, on Archive, and it was published in... Um, Astronomy and Astrophysics, um, and that's the archive identifier if you want to look at the paper. Um, <clears throat> so in this talk, uh, I'm, before I dive into uh, the specifics of Nifty and start showing you some code, I wanted to describe for you the types of problems that our group in particular was looking to solve with Nifty. I think it probably has applicability outside of the exact kinds of applications that we were looking at. I mean, it definitely has ap applicability outside of those applications, um, but we had, you know, uh, sort of a specific type of problem, or you know, we were trying to solve, um, we we're trying to solve statistical inference problems when we were trying to infer um, information that li that, uh, or we were trying to infer quantities that are defined on a continuous space. So we were trying to infer uh, the brightness distribution of galaxies as a function of angle on the sky, these types of things. Um, so, and, um, so I'll talk a little bit about the types of problems we, wanna, we wanted to solve and the language that we use when we were trying to solve these problems, because I think, depending on what your background is, some of the terminology that I use might not be um, too familiar. Um, so, in an inference problem, we're trying to infer some physical quantity that I am going to call a signal here. And this physical quantity um, is, in, in general, defined on a continuous space. So, and um, for instance, you might have a density of sound, or a density of uh, air. It's like sound waves as a function of time, or um, population density as a function of location on the Earth, something like that. Um, the position that you're working in is, is a continuous quantity. But um, we measure data uh, as just a discrete collection of, of points that we've captured via some measurement process using uh, some instrument or you know, surveying people, something like that. And we have some collection of points. Here I've shown just a, a sample one-dimensional collection of points, each one of them. Uh, if, if you've got 
I think the best data comes along with some estimate of uncertainties for each point. I've plotted er error bars here are shown for each of the data points. And um, we have some suspicion that our data is sensitive to this signal that we're interested in studying. And so the, uh, the goal of an inference algorithm is to provide an estimate of that signal. And of course, we can, we can generally write down our inf inference algorithm on pen and paper mathematically. And when we write down our mathematical description of the inference algorithm, it doesn't, we don't necessarily, in, in general, we won't have made any assumptions about the space in which the signal is defined. We aren't going to have our, our pen and paper algorithm explicitly uh, dependent on a one-dimensional space or a spherical geometry or something like that. We'll generally write it down independent of all of those things. But when we go to write code um, that, uh, that carries out that algorithm, we have to encode some specific uh, discretization of our space. And so uh, in our group, we had a number of people who were working on kind of similar inference algorithms, but in very different problem spaces. We had some people who were working with data that was defined on, a, on the surface of a sphere, um, others who were interested in, in looking at like time series data, which is like one dimensional data. Um, and so we had a lot of very similar code that we were writing, but uh, that in, but the underlying and the underlying math for each, all of these uh, you know projects was kind of the same, but because of the, um, the differences in, in uh, the specifics of how we collected data or um, some of the symmetries that were specific to a particular problem. We wanted to work in a specific space to take advantage of those symmetries. We were having to write a lot of very specific code um, for each one of these problem domains. And um, we had to worry about a lot of the same kinds of problems that were cropping up over and over. So we developed uh, Nifty, which provides a mechanism for writing an inference algorithm, one of which I'm going to talk about right now. It's sort of a, a good prototypical example um, that maybe some of you are, have heard of, uh, heard about before. It's called a Wiener filter. Um, a Wiener filter is very commonly used in, you know, many of our projects. We're going to use the mathematical formalism of Wiener filtering. Um, and so we wanted to write one function that was a Wiener filter and have it apply to all of our different problem spaces. And um, briefly, I'll talk about what a Wiener filter is. Um, it's a pretty simple example. Uh, but it's an important one because the Wiener filter, it turns out, is sort of the core of a whole uh, broad range of inference algorithms and machine learning algorithms. If any of you have heard of like common filters for doing, um, making orientation uh, estimation, um, that's effectively an, an extension of a Wiener filter. Or if you're um, familiar with Gaussian process regression, um, which is a, a popular machine learning uh, algorithm. It's basically an extension of Wiener filtering. So um, the core assumptions that go into a Wiener filter, uh, we have some signal field that um, we have some signal here that's we make a prior assumption that that signal is um, uh, has correlations according to a Gaussian distribution. This script DG here is just a shorthand for a Gaussian distribution with a covariance matrix capital S. Um, we also have the assumption that our data D is um, collected uh, or is related to our signal uh, via this linear relationship here where the signal has been operated on by this uh, capital, this, this operator, uh, I'll call it, uh, capital R. And this operator R just describes um, specifics of the measurement process. So if you're looking through um, an imaging system, for instance, this uh, R, capital R, which in uh, Nifty's terminology we call a response operator, uh, capital R would have like a point spread function. Um, 
So it might do a convolution, for instance. Or in my, in my specialty of uh, radio astronomy, when we measure, um, when we're taking measurements of a galaxy with a, um, a radio telescope, generally speaking, we're not taking a measurement of like an image of a galaxy directly, but we're actually sampling the Fourier transform of that image of the galaxy. And so this response operator would actually have a Fourier trans transformation in it, that kind of thing. Um, and then so also during the data collection process, we have uh, this vector here, n, which is a, a random noise vector, which uh, one of the other assumptions in a Wiener filter is that that noise is also drawn from a Gaussian distribution with a covariance matrix capital N here. And so if you make all these assumptions and you, um, I'm not going to get too much into the details of how you derive this thing, but if you plug all this stuff into Bayes' theorem, you find that the, uh, and, and you make some assumptions about what an optimal estimation is, you find that the optimal estimation under a given set of assumptions is given by this equation here. And so uh, this equation sort of em embodies some of the very common features of the various uh, stati statistical inference algorithms that we were writing. And so I'll just walk through it really quickly here. We've got this uh, data vector D that's operated on by this uh, operator N, capital N. So you can think of these capital letters here as being matrices or functionals, that kind of thing. Um, and so when I say that this uh, operator N is uh, operating on this field D, this is just a, you can think of this as just a matrix multiplication. So I take my data, I inverse, I uh, weight it by the inverse of the noise variance, and then I, this um, response operator here, I'm uh, applying it to that inverse noise weighted data um, in such a way that I'm basically just transforming from uh, the data space back into signal space. And so then uh, I take the, the result, which I'm going to call J here, um, I take the result and I multiply it by this big operator, uh, D, uh, which is just a combination of the signal covariance and the noise covariance, um, which have both been inverted and added together, and then all this together is inverted. Okay, so notice that nowhere in here have I encoded anything about the, the dimensionality of the space on which the signal is defined. Um, I haven't made any uh, assumptions about um, the resolution at which we want to try to make an estimate of the signal field, this estimate which, which I'm calling M. So uh, I just have this you know, equation that will be applicable for any type of space that I want to work in. And so um, the couple of main features here is I have a, uh, a space on which my signal is defined. This is just the geometry that I'm using to describe my problem. I have a field that exists on this, that exists on this space, um, which is just a, you know, basically a function evaluated at different points in the space. And then I have operators that act on fields, um, these capital letters. And so now we'll get into how uh, some of the features that Nifty has that um, let you sort of work with these uh, these uh, things, operators, fields, and, um, and spaces. So uh, a couple bullet points about what Nifty is. It's, it's a, I've mentioned before, it's a Python library. Uh, we incorporate um, some of the subroutines we've, we've translated into C using Cython, and we have some uh, libraries in C and C++ to just make things more efficient when we're doing things like uh, spherical coordinate transformations and things like that. There are a lot of these utilities in uh, Nifty that make it easy to work between, um, you know, spherical coordinates and um, spherical harmonic space or, um, you know, time uh, or like real space and Fourier space, that kind of thing. A lot of those transformations are actually encoded in C and C++. Um, and Nifty provides uh, classes that encode the behaviors of spaces, fields, and operators, so that um, a lot of the, you know, the common features of 
these three things um, can be implemented for different specific geometries, but then you can take a space, but then you can take a, a space that encodes any geometry and plug it into your uh, inference algorithm and it'll just you know, work the appropriate way. Um, and so a little bit of some details on these three fundamental classes in Nifty. A space is just defined by some set of parameters. For instance, a space might be a three-dimensional Cartesian space, and so you'll, uh, that you've pixelated in some way. And so your parameters would be like the number of dimensions in your Cartesian space and the number of pixels along each axis, something like that. Or it might be, a, you know, like I've mentioned a couple times, um, a spherical coordinate system, something like that, with a different set of parameters. Um, a field is just basically a num uh, NumPy array that's defined that lives on that space. So the values of the NumPy array are thought are you know considered to be um, defined at the various coordinates that are defined in the space, and a field has an associated space that is the domain on which it lives. And then there are operators that, again, they operate on a field in a particular domain space, and they spit out a result in a target space. And then there are a bunch of um, methods associated with operators that allow them to do various things to fields, like multiply with a field, uh, inverse multiply, um, things like that. So. Uh, in the main library, we have defined a number of very common spaces. Um, most notably, there's like a regularly gridded uh, Cartesian space. It's an n-dimensional regular grid. Uh, spherical harmonic space. There are two different uh, ways that you can describe the surface of a sphere, either using a heel pix pixelization, which is uh, this thing that's shown here. Um, it's a specific representation of, of the surface of a sphere such that each pixel has the same like angular size. Um, and you can also use a Gauss-Legendre Gauss grid. Um, and there are other uh, things that, like a point space, which is just an unstructured <laughs> list of points. You might typically define your data to live on a point space. Um, and then so there are a lot of different common operators that are defined as well. A diagonal operator you can just think of as like a, a matrix that only has diagonal entries. Um, or a response operator, which is what I mentioned in that linear measurement equation on the, uh, like earlier, the capital R was a response operator. Um, so there's a specific class that has, you know, basically initialize it with a specific set of um, parameters that a response operator generally needs. Um, and then there's the propagator operator. That's that capital D that showed up in the Wiener filter. That specific form of operator shows up all the time. So we've encoded it in, in its own uh, class that you can give um, the various submatrices that make up that capital D. Um, you can just give it, in, it as its uh, parameters when you initialize the, the class. And uh, and it'll put them together in the way that the propagator operator is supposed to be put them put together. So uh, that's just a quick overview of those base classes that are that are in Nifty. Um, it also provides a lot of useful tools for um, doing uh, visualization. You can plot fields really easily and plot fields against one another. I'll show this in a, in a demonstration in a moment. Um, there's also really useful tools that I've found. Usually we're working in uh, very high dimensional spaces and we have large matrices. And we don't want to encode these matrices explicitly, like with an actual two dimensional NumPy array with values in each, um, in each uh, element of the array. So instead, what we'll generally do is have some function that we call that acts as an operator. Think of like a fast Fourier transform that acts as and as you could represent a fast Fourier transform as a big matrix of Fourier kernels evaluated at different locations, but generally you're just going to make a call to some FFT library uh, or routine. And so um, in that case where you have an operator that's defined in code rather than actually a, a big matrix, um, and if it's very expensive to evaluate that code, getting things like the diagonal of your matrix can be very expensive. So instead, um, you would typically use a, a statistical sampling to try to 
make a few um, what we call probing. You probe the matrix in a few specific locate or in a specific way, um, such that you end up with an estimate of the diagonal of your matrix in the end. And we also have uh, that also works for getting traces of matrices and things like that. And that's all built right into Nifty. If you want to get the the diagonal of a of a of an operator. Um, it will know to do probing um, if that operator isn't defined explicitly. Um, and it, it includes extensive online documentation. Here's a, a screen grab of the Nifty homepage, which um, I have listed up here. Uh, it's also listed on the last slide, so we'll see it again later. But we've got everything really well documented, and the code's also really nicely documented. And the code's also up on GitHub. There's a, I'll show the GitHub uh, repository later. So now I'll do a, a short uh, demonstration. The demonstration is going to be uh, an implementation of a Wiener filter, um, which I've talked about a little bit already um, in an IPython notebook. And so let me jump to that. So before I get into the actual implementation of the, the Wiener filter function, um, I'll just show uh, some of the objects in Nifty in, in, uh, in use. So here I've created a space. This is a regular, regular gridded space. This is just a, and in this case, I've only given it one uh, argument in the um, constructor, which is just a number of pixels. So this will produce a one-dimensional regular uh, gridded space with 128 pixels. And so if I uh, print that space, I get some basic information about um, the, uh, the instance here, that it has 128 pixels, one axis, um, and then some information here, this Hermitian purely real zero center, that's all, that all has to do with if you're going to um, Fourier transform this, uh, uh, a field on this space, it has some information about exactly how you do that Fourier transform. Um, and last, the last field here is that this is not Fourier space. So if I, um, I can also, you'll notice this dist here. This is the, the physical distance of one pixel is listed as, as this dist. And by default, when you create a, a linear space like this, it makes the total range of the linear space be uh, zero to one. And so um, each pixel then is one over, in this case, 128 units wide, and that's what this number is here. I can also create a field that has a different distance per, per pixel. Um, and so the nice thing about uh, Nifty is when you're working in, uh, when you're working with these spaces, you've defined um, the, effectively the volume of each pixel, which might not be very trivial. It might not be that every pixel has the same volume. And so when you're doing things um, that are effectively integrals over your space, like doing a, an inner product between two fields on a space, Nifty knows to take these volumes into account when it's doing the, the inner products, or when you're doing a, op, a matrix vector multiplications and things like that. It knows to take these volumes into account. And so one of the things that we were really struggling with is people make, you know, our students and, and postdocs in our group writing code and making the same mistakes over and over uh, having our, our algorithms be properly normalized, taking all these volume factors into account um, properly. It's a real pain, especially when you're working back and forth between you know, Fourier space and regular space or um, something like that. Making sure that you're normalizing everything appropriately is, is not trivial. So Nifty does a lot of that work for you, or you know, we try to do all of it for you. Um, so you can take a field, so uh, I've defined a field here, F, on that X space that I created ab above. And uh, this is just a simple field. I've just put a, a value of two in each one of the entries. And so the field is basically just a big, like I mentioned uh, earlier, a big uh, NumPy array. Uh, and if you print the field, it prints out some um, nice summary information, the min and max values and the mean um, and median values, that kind of thing. Um, and it also, it tells you what space it lives on and then the target space. In this case, so the target space is, um, is like the harmonic space. Uh, in this case, it would be the Fourier domain. 
Um, and you can just really simply take your uh, field and transform it into this uh, harmonic basis um, with just one line. So I can do things like dot products or inner products with my fields. Um, and you'll notice, so these evaluate quickly. I'll just kind of jump through this stuff real quick. Um, I defined another field here on a different space. So I defined uh, x space 2, which is the same as the former space that I created, but I made the distance uh, a little bit different. And so um, this is just to show, I just want to show here that, so I have f defined on one space and f2 defined on another space. And if I try to, you know, take the dot product of these two fields, um, it complains about it, even though, you know, the NumPy arrays are the same length and all that stuff. So it knows that they exist in different geometries. Um, so let me get down to, well, yeah, let me show, let me show this. So <clears throat> I have uh, methods of fields, a method of a field called hat, which basically promotes a field to an operator. So it puts the values of that field on the diagonal of an operator. And then if I have an operator, I can also call operator.hat, and it'll take the diagonal of that operator and turn it into a field, which is a thing that's very commonly done. So there are a lot of these um, you know, helper functions to uh, move back and forth between operators and fields. Um, and uh, one nice thing that, that we typically do with operators is um, I can draw, I can treat an operator, if, I, if, if my operator is considered to be a covariance matrix of a Gaussian distribution, for instance, I can get a random field that obeys that uh, covariance matrix. And so um, I can take this operator F, um, draw, uh, get a random field, and so R now is, a, is uh, a field, and if I plot it, you can just see, you know, this white noise uh, uh, distributed uh, field on our space. Um, I can also plot the power spectrum of that uh, field really easily by just saying power equals true in the plot command. Um, and so then it's going to display the power in that field as a function of the, uh, the frequencies, the various frequencies. Um, okay, so getting into the, uh, into the Wiener filter. I have a little setup function here that's defined that takes in uh, a space, and this can be whatever space you want. And what this function is going to do is it's going to construct the various operators that we need for the Wiener filter, like uh, this signal covariance, the signal variance covariance matrix that I talked about earlier, a response operator that I talked about earlier. And so here I'm initializing a nifty response operator. Um, and in this case, this response operator is basically just going to be a unit matrix. It's not going to be anything fancy. Um, the signal covariance matrix is uh, a, sp a special operator called a power operator. It's just a diagonal matrix, basically, but that has a power spectrum that I've defined in this line above um, uh, along its diagonal entries. And it lives in, and it's uh, defined in Fourier space. Um, and then the last thing that I do, I do the same thing. I draw, uh, I make, make a noise vector, and then I compute some data. So the data that I'm computing is just my data vector D is my response operator times uh, this uh, S, the signal field. It's like, uh, you know, my, what I'm going to consider the truth that I'm trying to infer, uh, plus some noise. And so uh, then I return all that stuff. And then I have a function here that just makes some plots. I won't worry about that. But so now I want to look at um, the Wiener filter that I've to, uh, defined here. And I've written up here uh, very quickly the um, mathematical representation of the Wiener filter that we saw earlier, where I have this signal covariance matrix inverted uh, added to the noise covariance matrix inverted with the response operators. So this whole thing, you'll recall that I called, well, I called D. So this whole thing is uh, this propagator operator. So in um, in the implementation of the Wiener filter, I've 
uh, initialize this propagator operator with the various uh, sub operators that, that go into it. But then this uh, J matrix is the response times the inverse noise times the data. And so when I'm writing that out in Nifty, it's very natural. I just say R adjoint times or transpose times, if, if you will, uh, times the noise inverse times data. So it's a very natural, you know, it's exactly how you would read this line of math. You write it out in that exact way in code. Um, and then when I do my Wiener filtering operation, which is this propagator operator times this J uh, vector, uh, I just have D times J uh, written out. And these uh, various parameters that go into the uh, multiplication or this operator D, um, you'll notice that D is actually uh, like an inverse of some stuff, and applying D is kind of non-trivial, so Nifty has included in it a um, uh, conjugate gradient routine, and so these are parameters for the conjugate gradient. But um, so what I'll show here is if I define a space, which is a one-dimensional regular gridded space with 512 pixels, I can send that space into my setup routine and then apply a Wiener filter, and I get out uh, this result. So here's the original signal that I use to create this really noisy data here. Um, the signal to noise ratio is roughly is, is one, is how I set it up. And then uh, here's the Wiener filter reconstruction. The green line is my reconstruction from that noisy data, where the orange line is the original signal field that I was trying to infer. Uh, so that worked pretty well. Um, now what I can, oops. Now what I can do is use the same, the same functions, the same setup function and the same Wiener filter, but I'm going to define another space that's a two-dimensional regular gridded space. So this is a 2D, a 2D problem with 128 pixels along each axis. Um, the rest of the code here is exactly the same. And now I can make a plot of my original signal that I've drawn, which now lives in two dimensions and um, looks like so. Here's the data that um, I'm feeding into the Wiener filter. Looks really noisy. Uh, and here's the reconstruction. Um, I can do the same thing if I define uh, this heel pick space. This is just a, a spherical coordinate space. Um, pass it into the same set of functions. Here's all the output from a conjugate gradient. We can forget about that. Um, and here's my signal that lives in two dimensions. And Here's my data in, in the spherical coordinate uh, space, and here's my reconstruction. Um, so that's, that's what, uh, you know, sort of the primary design motivation behind Nifty was to be able to take the same algorithm and hand it problems defined in different uh, geometric representations and have them all work um, with the same code. So just briefly, a couple of applications that um, have made use of Nifty so far. Uh, these have all come out of our group at uh, the Max Planck Institute, but there have been um, people outside of the Max Planck Institute that have started using Nifty um, for pretty neat things as well. I, I don't go into all the applications here, just a few. So the first one, um, uh, a graduate student of mine and I were interested in developing a modern inference algorithm to um, provide uh, high fidelity image reconstruction in radio astronomy. And I mentioned before, when you're taking images in radio astronomy, you're not, you're not actually getting, you know, uh, collecting data that's, you know, uh, an image of a galaxy or whatever. This is just mock data that's, that's been created here. Um, uh, you're actually sampling uh, that the distribution in Fourier space, and it's an incomplete sampling. So uh, here's the original mock signal that we that we made up. Looks like some clouds or something. Um, if you just did a naive reconstruction, which is basically an inverse Fourier transform, this is what you would get. It looks awful. Um, and if I had big bright point sources in here, it would look even worse. Uh, and the typical reconstruction that uh, has been around for the last 30 or 40 years, and pretty much everybody uses um, it's called the, the clean algorithm. It gives you this result. It has 
I hope, I don't know if it shows up that well on the projector, but uh, there's uh, some characteristic like artifacts in the images, like kind of a stippling in the image. Um, and here's the reconstruction from our algorithm resolve that we created using Nifty. Um, we've done the, uh, a similar kind of thing. That was just in uh, taking a, an image at one frequency or taking collecting data at one frequency. Um, modern radio telescopes have extremely wide bandwidths, and you can collect mountains of data, uh, and, but nobody really knows the best way to reconstruct images in, in, of this data yet. And so there's a lot of work that needs to happen in terms of uh, deriving better algorithms. So our cut at deriving uh, a multispectral imager here, uh, you can see the results of not only do we reconstruct the brightness at a single reference frequency, but um, the distribution of the brightness as a function of frequency typically has a power law uh, type shape. And so we can also reconstruct the slope of the power law spectrum uh, with, with high fidelity. Um, uh, another thing that we did, uh, one of the first applications with Nifty, was we collected data, um, something called the, the, the Faraday depth of various extragalactic point sources, quasars and, and galaxies and things. Uh, you look at those in radio waves, uh, and particularly polarized light, um, polarized radio waves. And what you see is if you look at the polarized light from these uh, sources at different frequencies, the um, polarization rotates. And the way that it rotates um, is sensitive to the magnetic fields between the source of emission in our telescopes. None of that's really all that important. All that is, all that is to say that we have all these point measurements of this quantity that's sensitive to magnetic fields, and we wanted to make a reconstruction of the um, contribution to this, uh, to this quantity uh, that comes just from our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And um, because we were interested in studying magnetic fields in, in the Milky Way galaxy. And so this is the map that, that uh, was produced. You notice there's big gaps in the data here. Um, our reconstruction filled in those gaps. And here's an estimate of the uncertainty down here of our estimate. Um, uh, so that here are some papers describing that algorithm uh, in a lot of detail. Um, and lastly, this is Marco Zeleg, uh, the main author of uh, Nifty. This is his PhD thesis. He was interested in looking at um, gamma ray images, um, from particularly from the Fermi telescope. And gamma ray images are very noisy. They have uh, very wide point spread functions. So you have a difficult job, or it's really important to deconvolve your images. Um, and also, uh, he was interested in um, in a situation like this, maybe this is your, on the left here, this is your image. Um, it's very noisy, and you've got a bunch of these point sources overlaid on top of a diffuse, uh, smoothly varying background. And if you want, if you're interested in studying that smoothly varying background, you have to remove all the point sources. So he's de derived an algorithm that he calls D3PO um, that, uh, removes the noise, deconvolves the image, and separates the uh, smooth background from the point sources. And here's a reconstruction of just the smooth background from this uh, sample image here. And uh, here's the point sources that have been picked out by the algorithm. Um, and so that's uh, Nifty in, in a very brief nutshell. Um, Here's the project homepage and um, the GitHub repository if you want to check it out. Um, thanks.